Yinka, what a what a lineup! It's looking absolutely fantastic. What what made you want to do this to curate this Africa weekend? Well, I mean, I have a, um, a you know I had a relationship with the Opera House before, and um, in two thousand and five um, they commissioned a, a video I made called Odile and Odette. Oh yes, and there's some photo stills from that video downstairs, mm. and that was a very good working relationship. And then I was asked back to um, do, I've got a sculpture outside on, on Russell Street um, uh, called Globehead Ballerina. And she kind of, you know, she's, you know, I did see her sort of jury spinning, box yeah. and she spins. Yeah, she does a little, little turn. But anyway, um, so, and then I was also asked by, you know, Deborah Boo um, to um, do the Deloitte Ignite. And I thought, you know, because I've been, yeah, a few times to, um, you know, see Puccini, <laughs> very whippy, sentimental operas. But I thought, no, what I thought, you know, what the opera house needs actually is a, you know, a club night. <laughs> and a, you, know, and, you know, Afrobeat and some jollof rice. You know. Well, you've certainly delivered that. <laughs> um, um, you know, so I thought, okay, you know, we can... Um, we can what we can be watching, you know, uh, Traviata, and all that. But you know, we also want to get down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll you know, so, and I think I've got this kind of sch schizophrenic life anyway, where I kind of move from, um, you know, Swan, Swan Lake to Babasala. <laughs> you won't know what that is, but Babasala is like a Nigerian play. Um, so no, but it's that kind of bicultural thing where you're constantly negotiating and as you know you know London is a uh, it's a multicultural city yeah so and the opera house is central and I thought you know it would be just fantastic to you know because I enjoy all of you know I have been fortunate enough uh, to be able to uh, to have been schooled here so and I've been fortunate enough to experience a lot of kind of you know European arts and culture Yes. And I feel that, you know, it, it seems that the, the kind of balance, you know, it's not going the other way. And I thought that, you know, people should, I mean, you know, people know enough in London anyway because it, it's sort of multicultural. But it's a great opportunity to just say to people, look at this stuff. Yes. You know, all this stuff is around you. They're fantastic African artists, you know, African opera singers, uh, Africans who move between traditional art forms and avant-garde um, stuff. And um, so, yes, and I thought, you know, pulling all of this together in one um, event from the photographs of um, Rotimi Fanikayode. Which looked fantastic. The Nigerian photographer who passed away yes. um, in 1989, he died of AIDS. I encountered him as a student, and I, I'm a bit sentimental about them, actually, because the photographs are you know, they're from my own personal collection. And, but I'm, I'm kind of sentimental about the whole thing because I met him when I was a student and we were due to um, have a meeting, you know, in about a month. At that time, you know, there were things on television about HIV. Um, I didn't really know what it was. Most of us didn't really know. We were just scared because of the adverts on TV. Anyway, he unfortunately passed away and so I couldn't have that meeting with him, but I always admired the works. Mm -hmm. And the works at that time, I was a student, you know, and I think they were, and he was selling those prints, you know, for about 70 quid or something. But as a student, I couldn't really afford them. And I thought, one day, one day, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, but, but no, um, I, it's something that, you know, I, I would like to share with other people. Mm -hmm. And at the time he was producing that work, you know, the work really is uh, about, um, his, uh, his own sexuality and politics. And, and what period are we politics. talking about? We're talking late 80s. Yes. Um, you know, there was still a lot of homophobia around. Uh, it was quite a difficult environment to be working in as, you know, as a gay um, artist of African origin. Um, you know, not many people were doing that work. And, and, you know, Africans who, particularly, you know, I'm from Nigeria, and um, I know that certainly within Nigerian culture, you, you know, you certainly wouldn't make it public if you were gay. You know, um, it's kind of a very secretive thing. And unfortunately for him, 
you know, his family actually don't want to have very much to do with him at all. Mm. Um, they, you know, wouldn't come to his burial. Um, you know, quite quite nasty situation. And um, um, you know, so in a sense, though, you see, when people do think, when people think about African artists, they don't usually think about the wide range of work produced by African artists. And I and I felt very strongly about this for a very long time because. Mm. You know, in a sense, if you look at uh, somebody like Picasso and his um, impact on on Western modernism and the way that African art actually influenced his work, yeah. um, and that seems to be actually fine. No one cares, you know, if you're European and you're um, taking from, quote-unquote, you know, ethnic um, African art. Uh, you know, it's never an issue. Yes. But if you're if you're African, and you think you know, I want to make a work about Swan Lake, but why not? Yes. You know, and it's the kind of thing that because I I think that's actually important to show people that you know we're not ossified sort of mummies. You know, we're not kind of mummies uh, that that kind of with dead culture. You know, we are contemporary people. We evolve. We travel a lot. You know, we sit on aeroplanes now, mm. and we go anywhere. You know, so we can absorb um, various influences. And in a sense, that's what I've tried to do with this festival: mm. is to also celebrate um, and pay tribute to traditional African art. So you would be able to, um, you know, do things like drumming workshops, and but also to say, you know, here is Tunde Jagada, here is Josephine Amankwa. Yes. They're going to do um, Handel's Messiah, you know, um, from the African perspective, uh, and why not? You know, that is contemporary culture, yes. and I think that uh, the the films, the wide range of films that will be on the piazza um, that John Akronfra um, has put together is also quite quite an incredible range. I mean, I saw one of the films yesterday, uh, which is about um, you know um, black. Um, South Africans um, surfing <laughs> and the kind of tensions within that society. Yes. And, uh, you know, but I'd like uh, to just show people that in the contemporary world, um, you know, it's actually something to celebrate. You know, the, the fact that you can actually be, um, you, can, you can push boundaries hmm. regardless of where you're from um, in, the, in the work that you do. And, and you, you, you've pushed boundaries yourself. I, I'm interested to hear a little bit about your own work as well. And could you tell me how you got started, Yinka? Well, I mean, the, I um, went to art school, um, Central St. Martins. You know, it was called Bam Shaw at that time. And Bam Shaw is now merged with Central St. Martins. Um, mm. So now it's part of it. Um, well, I actually started off as a, um, I did life drawing mainly. Uh, and then um, I was very interested in the usual, you know, at that time, you know, all I knew was basically, you know, Cezanne Picasso and uh, Salvador Dali. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then, you know, in my second year, I got fed up with um, drawing from the nude. I couldn't understand why I had to, you know, keep kind of drawing new, nude people. And <laughs> so the, so I, I became kind of more, much more radical in the work. I became really political. So I got really interested in politics. And I, I was actually making work at the time. Because at that time, uh, the Cold War um, was just about to kind of, um, I guess, collapse the, the whole idea of the Cold War. And in Russia at the time, uh, they, there was a perestroika going on, which was the kind of new uh, reforms in, in Russia at the time. So, you know, as a, as a black African, I, I imagined that, that um, I was part of the kind of, you know, part of the world and the global conversation. So I set about, as a young artist, making work about perestroika. Mm. And <laughs> my, my tutors came into, you know, to my space and they said, Perry Stroika, you are African, aren't you? Yes. So why, why aren't you producing 
ethnic, authentic African art. <laughs> like, what? I grew up in Lagos listening <laughs> to James Brown and, you know, been watching um, Skippy on TV, um, an Australian <laughs> program at the time, um, and watching kind of Disney programs. And also, you know, speaking Yoruba at home. Um, so I thought, well, okay, uh, what's authentic? What's authentic um, African in a, in a kind of, um, in Africa which has, uh, ha which is kind of modern in a way, but you know, it's both modern and traditional, all mixed. And again, you know, I kept thinking, how come none of my colleagues in the college were being asked to, you know, my British, my English colleagues, yes. uh, to, to produce work about Morris dancing? <laughs> <laughs> You know, um, why would, you know, no one would ever suggest to them to make anything about Morris dancing. So um, I, then I thought, all right, the way to look at this is I started to actually ask a series of questions. Um, what is authenticity? You know, what does constitute the authentic? And then that's when I started to think about the fabrics. Yes. And so I went to Brixton Market. No, I, actually, the first place I went to in search of my African authenticity was actually uh, the Museum of Mankind. Do you remember? I've done the same <laughs> journey, <laughs> possibly with the same results of come, coming away weeping at the end. But I'm, you, you finish your story. Okay. So the, anyway, I went to the Museum of Mankind, <laughs> and I was faced with this kind of, you know, really kind of, um, really scary masks, but, but sort of detached, you know, because obviously, I mean, th those, those, um, ritual objects were not museumified objects. I mean, they were kind of part of r ritual. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I grew up in Nigeria, actually, I had seen, you know, uh, various sort of, um, festivals, you know, like there's something called Galade. Yes. And it, you know, and very beautiful, you know, because the, the masks, they were never static. You know, they were constantly moving and part of a ritual. So in that context, they actually came alive and they meant something. But when I went into the museum and I was looking at those kind of dead objects in glass cases, you know, I just didn't know what, what I was meant to be doing or looking at. And anyway, I, I did realize very, at the time that, look, there was a kind of detachment, you know, from those objects. And then later on, I realized that actually the detachment came from the, the fact that, you know, those objects were not sort of embedded into my daily rituals mm -hmm. and my daily culture yes. as a modern African. So, and then I thought, okay, what, what would the thing be then that would be embedded in my own daily rituals yes. as a modern kind of contemporary African? Yes. So I made this journey to Brixton and so I went to the market there, and then I went to the fabric shop, into the African textiles shop. Then I started talking to them about the African textiles because I used to wear those when I was in Nigeria as a kid. And then to my shock, I was actually informed that the fabrics are actually Dutch <laughs> produced, <laughs> that they're, they're not authentic African. So. What in search of authenticity, I found inauthenticity. Yes. And so I was actually, you know, all my illusions were kind of shattered there. And then I thought, all right, so what then is authenticity for me? And then I realized that actually, purely due to the encounter with Europe, um, is that my authenticity is in hybridity yeah. so that my I cannot find any other true me yes. outside of hybridity you know because I dream both well actually I, I, I mostly dream in English now so I've, <laughs> I've, I've been here too I've been here too long but but but, but I used to dream in both languages and um, so that's, in a sense, actually, what, why I started to use the fabrics. And then the, these, so, this 
piece called Double Dutch, obviously that's connected to... Yes, yeah, so Double Dutch is right at the beginning of that journey. Yes. Um, obviously, when, when you, um, you know, if you're saying things people don't quite understand, they say you're speaking Double Dutch. And then the Dutch wax thing. So it's kind of playing with, you know, kind of wordplay. Yes. And then um, I had actually trained as a, as a painter. And I remember being, you know, so sort of real academic training. I was being told, you know, I was told not to use, you know, vulgar colors, not to use black, whatever, blah, blah. <laughs> so, so that, that's actually a painter's protest, uh, this first piece, because the, the pieces are, they're done on fabric from popular culture, shock horror, yes. from the market, in it. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so I, I was, like, you know, painted on those, and I, I didn't, Realize, I mean, I, I was trying to do something. It was more like a sort of internal conversation I was having with myself, really. But then when I put the works into public spaces, all of a sudden I got this serious reaction. Wow, you know. And then critics writing all these things about the work, and I'm like, oh, really? Is that what it's about? Okay. Um, and then this kind of discovery of, of sort of, of mannequins of the human form um, yeah. in 95. I mean, how did that happen from the, 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 the flat panels of fabric and, and, and what were you pursuing there? Well, that happened, I was uh, at the Victoria and Albert Museum because I used to like to go to the Victoria and Albert Museum and I would kind of just stand there, you know, looking at this incredible frocks. Yes. And, <laughs> um, but then I also remember seeing photographs of people in, you know, far-flung tropical places in the 19th century wearing, uh, um, you know, uh, these dresses with, you know, bustles and all that. And so, and I thought, wouldn't it be great to just sort of ethnicize the aristocracy? <laughs> <laughs> and so, that, again, that, sound, that was kind of like a, a bit of a joke, you know, and then I produced the first piece, um, How Does a Girl Like You Get to Be a Girl Like You? Yeah. And that was done for a show at the Barbican, actually. Um, and, um, and then, you know, Mr. Saatchi, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Saatchi kind of collided with both Double Dutch and um, How Does a Girl Like And you what was that like? That, get to that, be a girl that like meeting you. with Saatchi. And, and it must have been an amazing moment because it's a period in which Tracy Emin, um, um, uh, Damien Hurst, a whole group of artists are suddenly coming um, into public notice. Yeah. And there is a sense that the art world is, is, is really taking notice of this generation. And you, as a young artist, finding your place amongst them, that must have been very exciting. Well, you know, I guess hindsight is a, is a great thing. But actually, at that time, we were all just kind of, we didn't really know that we were making anything. Because basically what happened at that time, it was a very necessary thing that we all had to do. Because the economy was terrible. Mm. It was, I remember kind of late 80s, early 90s. Mm. The economy, you know, like, I remember my year at Goldsmiths, and we finished my MA at Goldsmiths, and not a single student sold anything, right? Really? Yeah. But at that time, that was um, because the art market was starting to boom. It was the first wave or the first boom of the art market. Mm. And so basically, a lot of us left college knowing fully well that we were not going to get picked up by galleries. Right. And most of us didn't. So the show that Damien Hurst did. I remember that. Yes. It was very much part of that self. I was also in a, a number of warehouse shows. Mm. It was very much part of that kind of self-help. Thing. Not because we were particularly clever, not, you know, because there was absolutely no money around. So it's not that all the artists were just so, all of a sudden really clever and then they were going to single-handedly create a market, you know. But what happened was, if you didn't get together with your mates to make a show, you were actually not going to be showing because yes. nobody had the money to show you. Yes. So, 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 and the great thing at that time, that coincided with a lot of offices being empty yes. in London. 
So I was in a number of those shows, lots of empty buildings. I mean, it's too bad now in London that you know you can't just find a building and do something, because very much at that time you could. And so, and I also had a studio in a squat for a while, and you know, um, and so it was more of a kind of a self-help thing, really. Mm. Um, but it, it's so, but then you know, a lot of artists moved into kind of really run-down areas, and then of course, as the economy started to lift, you know, those areas became kind of really cool. And then the property developers moved in. And the rest is history. I mean, I used to be scared, scared to go to Hoxton Square. My God, do you remember <laughs> Hoxton Square? It was one of the, that, that club that was down there. It was the scariest <laughs> place. You know, if you said to Black Cab, you were going to Hoxton Square. <laughs> like, Sorry, mate. <laughs> you know, you, you can take yourself down there. I'm not driving you there. <laughs> you know. But overnight, yeah. it, it all transformed? Did it transform for you as well? I mean, it must have been amazing that suddenly it was, being an artist, it was cool, it was also financially well remunerated. Well, well, I mean, yes, with the help, with the help of one man. Yes. One single man. And that was Charles Saatchi. Because what Charles Saatchi used to do, because there was a lot of it around and it was cheap. And so he used to, whenever a show opened, because I remember this very well, the gallery wouldn't actually, they wouldn't open the show to everyone else. <laughs> Charles would come down to see the show first before anybody else could, could see it. And I remember when he approached the gallery, because the gallery, I was, um, I showed my work at a space called Independent Art Space. Yes. An independent art space was not too far from Charles Satch's house. And so he walked in when I was there with, there was a critic called, I mean, he's dead now, is it, is it David Sylvester? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, and he walked in with Charles Archie, so, and he was saying to, oh, you know, how much he liked my paintings and so on. Anyway, two weeks later, um, Charles Archie was interested in some of my pieces. And he, I didn't have a gallery at that time, but the same week, uh, Stephen Friedman also saw that show, and he wanted to work with me. And then Charles Saatchi wouldn't get back to us for quite a couple of weeks. And at that time, um, if Charles Saatchi simply walked by your studio, <laughs> it was literally like God walked by your studio. You know, it was, you just knew that if, it, if the hand of God were to touch you, <laughs> you know, the whole thing would change. And I was, that was probably the longest two or three weeks of my life. Because I would call Stephen and say, have you heard from Charles Saatchi yet? Said, no, we've not heard anything yet. I'm like, oh no. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, anyway, he came back and then he, you know, he, he bought some of my works. Um, I mean, luckily, you know, they're no longer in his collection, but, but he acquired them at the time. And that, from that point on, you know, because I was actually, I was doing fairly okay, you know, I had a part-time job, um, so I didn't really care much for, for the money. I was having fun, like, showing uh, with lots of other artists. And then, um, but I just knew that when that happened, you know... The, Things were going to change. Yeah, yeah. But then also that your work, there is a shift as well, that it, it both becomes... Um, I don't know, even, even more radical in a sense, that you actually place yourself within some of these images. Oh, yes. And mm -hmm. that some of the... That came later. Yes. Yeah, that came later. Yes. And some of the sort of identity politics is... It's, yeah, yeah. it's, it's even more sort of um, there. You really do feel it. Um, and I'm just... I mean, I imagine that there are all kinds of pressures on you to, 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 to take your... to perhaps produce more of the same or to... To, to radicalize in particular ways, and what made you then do this? Well, I mean, at that time, I didn't. I, I was lucky enough not to have any of those pressures because uh, I actually, you know, I, I had a, a part-time job, so I was working at, you know, for a charity called Shape, you know, and they work with disabled people in the arts. Hmm. Um, but it was a good job. I was based at Batsy Art Center. I was, you know, watching all kind of alternative radical theater every night. You know. <laughs> I was hanging out at the cafe, you know. So um, I didn't much care for trying to make something just for money. 
you know, I just wanted to do, to do uh, my own work. And so, and at that time, what I liked about it as well, it was a very kind of politicized period of time. It wasn't a time, you know, there wasn't much money around. We didn't even know what money really looked like, you know? So, I mean, we kind of knew, but people who had money were, were like really far away from us. Do you know what I mean? Like, you just wanted to do your stuff. And yes. then, because um, now, you know, the art world is very different. You know, as you know, you know, you're, you're talking serious money now in the art world. But at that time, it was never really like that. As a young artist, you just really did, you know, what you, you know. And I, you know, I hate to sound like the good old days, because that sounds <laughs> awful. You know, I hate it when people sound like that. But actually, um, on the on the kind of um, commercial front, or in terms of any kind of commercial pressures. Hmm. Um, because also, you see, I was not really a full YBA, in the sense that, well, I don't quite know how to put that, but you see, I was also very interested in minority politics mm. and in black politics. And so, yes, I was very much in the art world, you know, I'd been to Goldsmiths and very much part of all that. But I, but I always felt that, you know, the system needed to be, to be shaken because there was still racism on TV. Mm. You know, I mean, there were still people like Jim Davidson and, you know, uh, black minstrel show and some of those things were still on television. So I had more questions, you know, that, that I want I wanted to ask, you know, through my work. And because the um, diary of a Victoria and Dandy series, yes, um, those were actually made for the London Underground. Yes, and so I announced myself with these huge posters yes. on the London Underground, and people couldn't figure out what the hell is that, you know. <laughs> And what um, was it? I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of Hogarth and those wonderful Georgian and Victorian series. Of, but um, what was it that you were really kind of grappling with here? First of all, I didn't like the idea of being uh, marginalized. And I didn't like, you know, because I, I sort of looked around me and it was actually quite difficult um, at that time for ethnic minorities in the UK. And I don't, you probably remember the, um, you know, the Brixton riots. I do, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> those were tough, you know, those were quite tough times. Yes. And then the, all of this was before the Stephen Lawrence inquiry and all, all mm. the, you know, all this. You know, society is very much different now. Yes. So it's a very different kind of environment. So I wanted to be placing the black body into a much more kind of um, unexpected situation, put it that way, you know, so that, you know, I, why can't I be a member of the aristocracy? Why can't I depict myself as a member of the aristocracy? And then, of course, you know, as an African, there's always been this kind of colonial relationship as well uh, with Victorian times and Victoriana. And so I wanted to kind of, I guess, parody as opposed to being angry, I wanted to actually mock, mm. you know, uh, the, the whole thing of, of class and hierarchy and all that. Mm. And I wanted to do it in front of about four million people. <laughs> 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 you know, and the best way I could do that was to actually be, to be bold. Yes. You know, and I have to say, actually, as a younger man, I had balls in those <laughs> days. <laughs> you know, because basically, I just, I just basically approached Geneva, uh, Institute of International Visual Arts, and I said, I'm going to do this project, and it's going to be absolutely fantastic. Can you give us some money? And, <laughs> and they looked at me, and they said, we have no money. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but you know, you're going to raise the money, and it's going to be really good. And it was. <laughs> yes, yes. And, um, I, I think they just couldn't believe the audacity and the confidence because <laughs> I think I wanted like a hundred thousand or something. Right. You know, I just wanted a ridiculous amount of money to do this, um, you know, to do this project. And I was a young artist with no track record. It's like, <laughs> what is he talking about? <laughs> you know, but, um, but then anyway, it's this, and I did the same with Freeze magazine. Yes. You know, I called them up, you know, I've got this show. It's going to be amazing. Come and have a look. Yes. You know, and I think, yeah, that time. You know, now, you know, when you're kind of slightly, um, 
I don't know, when you're slightly innocent, you know, you don't, you don't think consequences. You just go and get what you want. A lot of the things I did then to get my career started, I don't actually think I would be able to do them now. Because I think I know too much now about how things work. You know, I think, oh, well, they're probably going to say no anyway. But then at but, the same time, Yinka, that this piece that you did um, um, at the National Gallery. Yeah. 2007, it's not that long ago. I mean, it's not the sort of, it doesn't deal with the kinds of things that I imagine that um, the average person going to the National Gallery would go there to, to see. That it's, it is still quite hard hitting. I don't think yeah, you yeah. compromised a great No, no, but you see, I think once you've got the, f when you're on the first rung of the ladder, you know, it's much easier to get things done. Yes. You know, and in fact, you will, you know, you'd get invited to get things done. Yes. But the difficult thing is getting onto that first rung of the ladder. Yes. You know, and that's the part that, that's actually difficult. Not, not once you're on. Yes. Because by the time I did the diary of the Victor and Dandy, you know, that was nominated for a kind of photography prize. You know, and then uh, how does a girl like you get to be a girl like you? Yeah. Was in sensation at the Royal Academy. So I'd done all the kind of, you know, I'd kind of, I guess, sopped with the devil oh, by, that, no. <laughs> by that time, you know, so things were kind of a bit easier. But the National Gallery, um, I was actually invited to uh, put something in the National Gallery at the time when they were celebrating the, how many years of slavery at that time? The abolition, the ab um, so abolition so of the slave trade. 1807 to two, yeah, yeah, exactly, the abolition of the slave. Yeah, yeah. And at the National Gallery, they, they had portraits of two people who were heavily involved uh, in the slave trade. Um, Mrs. Oswald, I think her name is, yes. Con Connell Talton. Yes. And so I, I asked for their portraits to be removed, and I replaced their portraits with this pheasant being shot and, um, you know, with this kind of blood splattered. <laughs> and I had actually saw some members of the board at the National Gallery yes. refuse to come to my opening. <laughs> Did they but, really? Yes, they absolutely refused uh, because they didn't think the National Gallery should have contemporary art, you know, especially not something like this, you know. But that pleased me. I mean, I, di I didn't mind at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the interesting um, thing is that this journey that you've taken right yes. into the heart of the establishment, I mean, has it, has it changed you? Do you feel a different Yinka? Um, well, you know, in many ways, I, I have to salute the kind of generation before me. You know, that's why I'm actually very happy that Tony Allen agreed to, um, to do the, you know, to do the music tonight. You know, he's of that kind of radical generation of Africans, um, you know, Fela Kuti and so on. And so in a way, um, lots of people, you know, the civil rights movement and so on, uh, and, um, They've actually made it possible for someone like me to to have the freedom to do the things that I do now. So actually, a lot of the struggles they had, in a way, kind of paved the way for you know people of my generation. So, but I, I don't feel, uh, um, you know, I, I you know, there is one thing that I'm always baffled by, and what what I'm really baffled by is this notion that one has actually sold out by having some success. Well, your Turner Prize nominated, you're an MBE, you know, member of the British Empire. What, so what does that mean? Well, that just basically means that empire is over. <laughs> <laughs> it means empire is over, and you don't have to be threatened by it. If you're threatened by it, you're somewhat kind of confirming your own subservience. So I actually don't see why people are so bothered by this. I was um, at a party and there was a, um, there was a lawyer who was absolutely furious that I would use those letters after my name. And I said, you know, well, what's the big deal? And she said, well, you know, um, I'm Irish and I represent um, a lot of, you know, um, black prisoners uh, at Brixton. Uh, in Brixton prison. And I said, well, you know, so is that why I shouldn't have those uh, letters after my name? 
I said, well, I mean, she said, well, you know, you know the history of empire, you know that. I said, yes, you know, but that stuff's over. You know, it's not, it, it's, it's history. And the point I'm actually making, it's very important that there's a, you know, there's a diversity in the United Kingdom. And, you know, people of African origin are very much part of this society now. So there's no, there's no need to have a chip on your shoulder or to be point scoring. You know, you are very much part of this society. Um, and honor is something that's given for, you know, your contribution to this society that you're part of. No need to hide, no need to run, you know, be mm -hmm. part of the society. What's the fight? You know, there's, you, you can help and change the society by being part of it, by somehow um, evading those things, or as, you know, you're, you're immediately suggesting that the power of empire is still so strong and the society itself is working against you. But that is not something I would subscribe to. You know, if you want to change, you have to change it from within. And so, and I think it's also very important, you know, Every time I see, you know, every time I see a diversity within British politics, then that makes me very happy. And I think that people of African origin should belong to all political parties. There should be a diversity. You know, people shouldn't be, feel that they have to be pushed. You know, um, and you know, I'm black. Um, I have an MBE. I, I enjoy capitalism. Um, <laughs> I enjoy capitalism, and I'm a champagne socialist. <laughs> and I think, and I think everyone should, and I think everyone should have a Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> and and has, it, um, has it softened your appetite to be radical in your work? You know, that has actually feeling being in the kind of white flame of of, of the establishment. You know, actually kind of being in the kind of heart of things, of having kind of some of the sort of financial success that I imagine that you would have seen in your younger days as something that was nigh on impossible. Having all of those things, has it kind of um, softened some of your appetite to do really radical things in terms of the actual work? Not necessarily. I mean, because, you know, I'm not necessarily impressed by money just because of my background. You know, so it's not something that, that can actually change me. Do you, do you see what I mean? Because, mm. um, you know, I mean, it's a known fact that I'm, I, you know, I'm from a middle class Nigerian background. So it's not like suddenly something new, something different has happened. Do you see what I mean? So yes. my personality wouldn't actually change just because, you know, um, yeah, just, just because I'm continuing the, the, the family tradition. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and and we Nigerians are kind of capitalists anyway at heart. So so, so it's a family tradition. So the, the you know, um, but it's more interesting to be bohemian within that. Yes, it's much more interesting uh, to push the boundaries push the of things. Much more interesting. And you really so. did hear with um, on the fourth plinth, um, the ship in a bottle, and and what was the idea there? Well, I mean, you know, Trafalgar Square. <laughs> you know, I remember actually being here in the UK when I lived in Nigeria for the summer holidays. Yes. And I just remember all those all those pigeons, uh, <laughs> Trafalgar Square. Um, well, I mean, you know, it's the center of the city. It's uh, you know, very very important place. And of course, you know about the fourth plinth uh, competition. Yes. And I was approached to do it, and I, um, you know, and I, the first time actually I was approached to do it, I didn't do it because my diary was very full, and I had, you know, I was very busy, and so, and then, I the second time I said yes, and then I put I put forward a proposal, and um, that's the kind of you know ship in a bottle, and Nelson's ship, you know, it, I mean, it's a very simple thing a Nelson ship in a bottle. And I thought that, you know, it'll be good to just have this, 
in a way, kind of politically radical piece, but at the same time, um, magical piece as well. You know, so, and that's, in a way, what I want from a work of art. It's a combination of politics and magic. Yeah. And I think that you know, the work might be radical, but at the end of the day, you know, you're looking at art. You know, if you listen to a piece of music that's uh, very political, and it's just words, but musically doesn't work, you know, that, you know, it's always form and content. Mm. How does one marry, uh, marry those two things? So, but I, I, you know, the, and as you know, the share audience at Trafalgar Square, I mean, the number of people per hour, I mean, it's over a million per hour, that, you mm. know, so in a way, um, I, I kind of loved sort of doing that project. Mm. And, and your work has always been aesthetically arresting. It's always been beautiful. It's always made people feel kind of better about, about, about themselves and about things. And I think it's that kind of um, sense of, um, of feeling uplifted that um, I, I always kind of take away when I come from seeing your work. And with this Odile and Odette, I really did kind of, it's, it's so sumptuous and so gorgeous. Um, is, 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 is ballet something that has, has always um, intrigued you, interested you? Um, well, I mean, you know, ballet, as you know, is a kind of a beautiful thing. But one thing I was going to mention, though, is that with, within my work, and I'm sure you know that, there's always the kind of gallows humor. Mm. Um, you know, there, there's a dark, there's always the, the kind of dark underbelly. And so what I try to do, even with the most kind of gorgeous things I do, I'm always wanting people to kind of search for the dark side. You know, it might not be out front, but it's, it's, I can assure you it's always there. So it's not all kind of pretty flowers, you know. It's, <laughs> uh, um, and so with something like Odile and Odette, um, and you know the story of Swan Lake. Yes. Um, the, you know, the black swan and, and the white swan. And in a way, that's, that, um, that dichotomy, that, that, that sort of light and dark thing, it's a very divisive thing within society. Um, a lot of the unfortunate things we have in the world throughout kind of the history of humankind, you know, from the Holocaust to all kinds of nasties, uh, those things actually start from mm. uh, uh, the kind of simple stereotyping of people, um, you know, uh, simple abuse can, you know, we all know that, that it, it does lead to the final solution, which is the Holocaust. And so I may, um, produce things that kind of look subtle. You know, to some people, I'm just sort of simply playing with a couple of ballerinas. Mm. You know, but, but there's, uh, you know, uh, if you actually see the, the video, uh, the dancers are uh, constantly, you know, one looks like a reflection of the other. Mm. And the piece is better expressed within the moving image, actually. Yes. Uh, and then they're constantly changing. You know, it, it's hard to know whether they're a part of the same body or whether they're, they're kind of divided. So behind all of the kind of, um, you know, the beauty, uh, other kind of darker, There's a tension. darker um, aspects of, of humankind that I, I try to explore within the pieces. Mm. And I was fascinated looking at, uh, um, yeah, I, I looked up Swan Lake, um, um, and there are so many alternate ending so many variations on that last act and in a way looking back at the trajectory of your career um, that it's followed kind of huge changes in diversity but also in the history of of Africa I mean do you feel optimistic about the future I mean do you feel that it's a time that we should be looking forward to the the future with 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 open arms well you know for I mean, one thing, I have to say that I watched the um, Olympics opening ceremony with kind of almost tears in my eyes, really, because uh, I saw, you know, well, you know, Doreen Lawrence, the 
Um, and I saw a picture of Britain that, that I just, that just kind of made me kind of very happy in a way. Because actually, a lot of the things we take for granted now, I mean, there might be people who, who say, oh, you know, uh, things are still terrible, that, you know, things are so bad. But they don't know what bad is, you know. Because, <laughs> you know, my, my uh, parents' generation, I mean, they, they would, you know, there'd be a, a flat available. And there'd be adverts in the paper, you know, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. And, um, you know, you wouldn't get the apartment just because of the color of your skin. So actually, I think the, the various human struggles uh, have uh, actually paying great dividend now. So I would add that actually the changes now are absolutely fantastic. And also, you know, um, a lot more can be done. More can always, always be done. And I also am I'm, I'm extremely optimistic for Africa as well, because actually those colonial relationships are changing dramatically. Uh, the trade relationships, the, and you know, and Africa itself is um, just, I mean, the growth that's actually happening on the ground is a well kept secret. You know, I think in another, I don't know, 20 or 30 years time, you're looking at a completely different continent. Mm -hmm. And you know, I went to Nigeria to visit in April. And I was literally blown away just by the size of the telecoms industry, <laughs> yeah. you know, and the way people use mobile phones. I mean, they do things with mobile phones that we haven't even started doing here. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I think that um, it's, you know, generally it's kind of not all bad, but all of those things didn't come easily. I mean, the various struggles for independence within Africa in the 50s, you know, I mean, the various kind of pan-African movements and so on, you know, and negritude, negritude mm -hmm. within the, I mean, this is your territory, you know, you know mm -hmm. about all this. Um, so none of those things have actually come um, easily, but change is definitely, you know, uh, well, I mean, you know, Afrobeat at the Opera House. Yes. I mean, exactly. that's, <laughs> you know, that, also, that's, that's a change there. And the wonderful thing about your work is it, it charts a lot of that journey, but it does it so beautifully with such dignity. And it is a real pleasure to talk to you, Yinka. And I can't wait for this weekend. And, uh, you know, may the music begin. And thank you very much for joining me on stage this evening. Thank you very okay, much. Thank indeed. you.